Okay, so last week we began the Tanya, the teachings of the Tanya, and we pretty much went over an introduction as to what Hasidut is. The Kabbalah, as you know, was only introduced to the masses in the past 400, 500 years or so. Hasidut, you may have heard the term Hasid, has a little bit of a relationship with Kabbalah because they implement they implement many of the concepts that are found in the Kabbalah into their life and how they conduct themselves and, how, and what they emphasize in life. Judaism is not just a religion, it's a way of life. But when a person conducts himself in a very dry manner, just performing rituals, it can become boring, it can become uninteresting, it can become heavy. And there's always the danger that perhaps a Jew may find other ideas, other beliefs, other philosophies more attractive, more exciting. So Hashem, of course, orchestrates everything in the world. Nothing happens by chance. The fact that certain great rabbis came down into the world when they did was to enlighten us with another approach, which is really not another approach that never existed, but was never emphasized, and to teach the people, to guide them to emphasize what is really important and what really matters, and that is being together, being united, being happy, doing things for the real reason, not doing them because they are instructions that we need to follow without understanding what they are. Hasidut, therefore, did a tremendous favor to the Jewish people by emphasizing the closeness that we need to be with Hashem, not just by believing that He exists, in Emunat, for example, but in Bitachon, in trusting in Him, in relying on Him, in understanding that everything that happens in this world is by divine providence. Hashgachat, Hashgachat Hashem, Hashgachat Pratit. So there are many concepts in the Kabbalah and in Hasidut that were unknown to people. And as a result of our knowledge, our exposure to them, it helps us understand a lot better what is happening in the world, and it helps us to cope better with all the ups and downs that we have in, in this physical world. This physical world, as you know, contains many challenges. No matter how good you are, no matter how wealthy you are, no matter how good you have it, everyone, everyone has different kinds of challenges. And when, therefore, when one learns the basics of Kabbalah, and I'm saying the basics because real Kabbalah is difficult, it's not intended for everyone, and I cannot even teach it in public, even if I wanted to. What we are doing is covering the basics, the main concepts, as they are implemented in Hasidut, which is what the Sefer Tanya covers. And I assure you that for those of you especially who have never learned Tanya, this is an eye-opener. It really is something very, very different than what you're used to hearing, but it's very helpful. You want to know why it's helpful? Well. If you read the introduction to the Tanya, you will see that he wrote this because he realized that many of his students were asking him all kinds of questions concerning Avodat Hashem, concerning the service of God, how to be close to God, how to do His will, how to stay out of trouble. All kinds of questions, all kinds of temptations, difficulties. And he decided to put it all together in a book so people can review it and remember what the best advice is to deal with a particular situation. He does say, however, that there's a big disadvantage to putting something in writing versus hearing it directly. When you read something, well, you don't have a direct connection to the one who's saying it. So it's very, very different. It has a different effect. Plus, everybody has a different level of understanding. Not everybody's the same. So to read from a book people may not have the same clarity that they would have if they would hear it directly from the individual, from the teacher, where they can ask, where they can review whatever is difficult for them. Nonetheless, this is an important book in helping guide everyone who needs guidance, and we all need guidance, in how to better serve Hashem. He does say, however, those who do have a difficult time in understanding this book should consult with the rabbi. It's not a good idea to live with doubts. We have questions, we have doubts, and we have to resolve them. This book, the Sefer Tanya, is divided into five parts. Even though many are familiar with the first part, called Bikutei Amarim, 
which is a collection of essays that he put together, important ideas that are known in Judaism, but not very much elaborated on. Remember, Kabbalah and Hasidut is mysticism for the most part. So there's not that much elaboration. So he elaborates a little bit on those points that are mystical in nature, but are important nonetheless. In order for us to better understand what we're doing here, who we are, what Hashem expects of us, these ideas that he elaborates on are very important. So the first part is called Likutei Amarim, where the emphasis is on Hitbonenut, which is to think about the Creator, to look up at creation and all the wonders of creation, how great this Creator must be, to ponder on that, and hopefully through the performance, through the observance of the mitzvot, having the proper understanding, having the proper attitude as to what we're doing, we may be able to connect to Hashem in the strongest way possible, which means to have the love and the fear for Him, not to just do things as a ritual. But in order to be able to connect through the love and fear of Hashem, He stresses the need to intellectualize these ideas. So that is what the rabbi very much emphasizes, is that there is a need to intellectualize it, to understand them, not to just be emotional about it. Hasidut is about emotion. It's about simcha, it's about joy. But Rabbi Schneir Zalman puts an emphasis on intellectualizing, on understanding the concepts, and understanding how they relate to our day-to-day -day lives. The second part, Chelek Sheni, has to do with Yehud and Emunah, which is about the unity of God. And it's not only about the unity, the Achdut of Hashem, and therefore uh, excluding any other medium. There's no medium. In other words, we speak directly to Hashem. There's no in-between. So when we say Shema Yisrael Hashem, Elokein Hashem Echad, we're not just emphasizing that Hashem is only one, that there's only one power out there who's responsible for everything. In that section, he also discusses, reveals to us, how the entire creation is really part of his essence. So when you look at creation, you're looking at him in a sense. I mean, he has no form or shape. But the entire creation as we see it is a reflection or a partial revelation of what Hashem is and what He wants from us. The third part is called the Geret Tshuva, that has to do with Teshuva, with repentance. But it's not just about repenting on a particular sin. A person may have committed certain transgressions. Teshuva also deals with how one can grow, self-growth how one can become a better person, how one can refine his character and elevate himself to greater heights. Then we have the fourth portion, the Geret Kodesh, which has to do with all kinds of concepts in Kabbalah. And these are Igrot, these are letters that he wrote to his students and contain some of the explanations about why we do certain mitzvot, what is the meaning behind certain mitzvot, especially the ones that are not so clear, are not so logical to us. And the fifth chelek is called Kuntra Sacharon, which are deeper concepts, but in some ways it's a continuation of the Igeret HaKodesh, and it does resolve what appears to be many contradictions. So it, it does clarify a lot of those deep concepts. Even though this book, the Sefer Atanya, is intended really for Jews, we're talking about Avodat Hashem, the service of God, and how to do it right, how to understand what we're doing, understanding the purpose of life. But everyone, even those who are not Jewish, can gain a lot from it. It's something that can interest many. What we're not going to do is we're not going to go word for word. We're not going to go through every little uh, word or every expression that he says. Uh, the Tanya is available in several languages for those who want to learn it go word by word, it's, it's a good idea. Instead, what I decided to do is to speak about the more important teachings, what we can learn from every single chapter in every one of those sections. Plus, 
I will also elaborate a little bit more. I will go beyond what the text says. There are a lot of courses, a lot of lessons in Tanya. They don't necessarily go beyond the text. They explain what he says, but you know, I think that in order for the general public to really understand what is going on, it's, it's a good idea to elaborate a little bit more on these concepts and how they relate to us. In the very, very beginning of the book of the Tanya, he begins with a very famous Gemara about what happens to the baby as he exits into the world. What was going on with this baby right before he exited into this world? This is a very critical moment. Now, we look at it as a baby, they're so cute, whether it's a boy or a girl, mm -hmm. but this baby contains a neshama. This baby will one day, Bezrat Hashem, God willing, will be an adult, or hopefully a responsible adult. Hopefully they will succeed in life. Hopefully, hopefully they will do the right thing. We don't know that. A baby is a baby. That baby can be a beautiful person later on, or it can be a very destructive individual. As a baby, we don't really know. But what happens on the spiritual level? That's what's interesting. Doctors cannot see that. The gynecologist will not be able to know that. Nor the mother, nor the father. What happens really is that this neshama, this soul, after all, it's not just a physical body. We believe that there is a soul. And we're going to talk a little bit about this soul in detail. What is this soul all about? This soul actually receives instructions. They communicate to this soul before it comes down into the world. They give it strength. They give it the tools it needs to survive in this physical world. And I say in this physical world because the soul is spiritual. So it doesn't speak the language of the spirit of the physical world. So it has to know how to cope, how to deal, how to survive, how, how, how to succeed. So what's important for every human being to know is that every, every one of us has a purpose. Not, not only does life have a purpose, creation, but every human being has a purpose. And from the very beginning, even though one is a baby and one is not mature enough, but ultimately that is what we need to focus on. As we grow older, don't lose focus of what we're here for. We're not here to eat, we're not here to sleep, we're not here to just have fun and work. There's something else. And that is what is being taught to the baby prior to him coming down to this world. The Gemara, for example, says as follows. Right before the baby comes out, they teach the baby, they teach him the entire Torah. What does that mean, the entire Torah? It's not just about the commandments. It's that they give him the guidance that he needs. They endow him with a certain amount of, of uh, intelligence, a certain amount of I guess, knowledge of what he needs to know, he or she, what they need to know as they enter this world. They are given that. They don't expect the human being to figure everything out on his own from scratch. Somehow, he is given that information prior to him coming out into this world. But it's not just information. They make sure to remind him, be careful. You are a clean soul, you are a pure soul. Make sure that when you come back, when you leave this world, you return that soul clean as well. <clears throat> okay, so what does all that mean? What that means is that they remind the child, they remind the baby, you have responsibilities. You know when you get a driver's license, they tell you, a driver's license is not a right, it's a privilege. You have to know how to drive. <laughs> a vehicle is dangerous. You better know what you're doing. So a baby is reminded too, listen, life is about responsibility. You're going to be held accountable. But we're going to help you. We're going to prepare you. We're going to teach you the entire Torah. Great. So now the child has been given the know-how, the strength, the knowledge, how to deal with this world, how to succeed. 
Then something strange happens. As soon as he comes, right just about when he comes out, there's an angel that comes, gives him a little slap, and he forgets everything he learned. Mm. Have you heard that one? Yeah. <laughs> so the question is, I've always asked, well, wait a minute. If he's forgetting everything, then why do you teach it to him? Why teach it to him if you're going to make him forget it? So what do you say? Teaching, providing him with the tools, is a necessity. The neshama needs to have it at least subconsciously. It needs to know right from wrong. The reason why they make, it for, make him forget it is because life is about free will. We do have choices. It can't be too obvious. Plus, the Jew has a special goal, a special job, a special mission. What's the mission of the Jew? To uncover the light that is concealed, the divine light. In this physical world, the Kabbalah teaches, of course there's divinity, but that divinity is concealed. Not everybody sees it. You have a lot of people that don't believe in God. I don't see him, even though to us it's clear. To many of us, it's obvious, but it is partially concealed in order to enable free will. So the Jew, part of his mission is to reveal that to the world, to teach it to the world. Monotheism. To uncover that light that is being covered, concealed. So right before he comes out, they tell him that this is his job. They teach him the Torah, which are the tools, but they also do something else. They make him swear. They make him swear, make sure that you are a tzaddik. Make sure that you stay righteous. What's that all about? Make sure that you are a righteous man, a righteous individual. What does swearing do? You know, when they make the president take an oath when he becomes president, you think it really makes a difference? <laughs> What he swears, well, hopefully it makes a difference because if you take this seriously, you take the job seriously, you take the oath seriously, it reminds you that you better be careful. You have to be responsible. What happens in real life, many people don't do necessarily what is right. They do what they like for themselves. Not necessarily what is good for others, not necessarily what is right, but what is good for them. Conflict of interests. The child is being reminded, listen, life is not about yourself. There's taking care of, there's taking care of other people too. There's a lot of responsibility. So, tzaddik, to be righteous, what does it mean? It means not to be selfish. To be, to be righteous means to do the right thing even if it's painful for you. Because it's the right thing to do. It's the correct thing to do. It's what is expected of you to do. But in order for, for him to be continuously impressed by that and not to forget, not to lose focus on that, somehow, because of that shivua, because of that oath, he's a soul, remember? He took an oath. Somehow, he will maybe, maybe have that strength to be able to resist the temptation. At least... They gave him the, the tools, the know-how, and subconsciously, he's supposed to know that, that he should be responsible. So the shivua, the purpose of making him swear, the purpose of the oath, is to subconsciously remind him that he better be careful with his actions because he's accountable for them. Otherwise, why make him swear? Why would you make someone swear unless you want to give him the extra strength that he may need to resist? Otherwise, if a person sees a challenge, he says, well, I couldn't make it. It's just too difficult. I'm stuck in traffic. I'll just go back. But if he swore to get to the destination that he committed himself, he swore, he says, well, I swore that I'm going to get there regardless of how difficult it is. So that shivua, that oath is very, very important. So they make him swear, be careful, stay focused. And what should you stay focused on? being a tzaddik, being a righteous person. It's interesting that the word mashbi'im in Hebrew 
has the same root as the word masbi'im, with a sin, sova, svi'ut, to be satisfied, to be satiated, because that's what they've done. By teaching him the Torah and by making him swear, they have given him what he needs to be strong enough to resist the pressure. So he has become satiated, in a sense, with a lot of power, spiritual power, know-how, to be able to resist any temptation. However, he has to want to, he has to be focused, he has to aspire for that. So the meaning behind the words Tihet Sadiq is not only to tell him stay out of trouble, it's also to remind him, listen, if you want to really do a good job, then you have to want this, you have to aspire to be a tzaddik. Not everybody wants to be a tzaddik. People are thinking about their careers, thinking about to buy a home, a car. They aspire to improve their, their material situation. No, they remind them, this is the purpose of life, is to be a good man. Not a rich man, it doesn't say anywhere that one should be a rich man. That, that is what he has to aspire to. So Tihet Sadiq is two things. Be careful, you're responsible, but also if you want to really be one, then you have to aspire, you have to want it. As the baby comes into this world, even though it was told that the purpose of it is to be a good man and to uncover this light that is concealed Every human being in this world, Jew and non-Jew, has a different tafkid. We're not all the same. This is a very important idea because a lot of people misunderstand the Tanya, especially in the first chapter, when he makes a certain distinction between Jews and non-Jews, that there's somehow a bit of discrimination or superiority complex of sorts. It's not about that, no. We must remember that Human beings are different. Men and women. Is it fair for a woman to say, I'd love to be a man, or a man to be a woman? Even though I know some men are trying to become women, and some women are trying to become men. It's not about being identical. If you want equality, I understand. But identical, they're not. A woman gives birth. A man does not exactly carry the baby. It's just, they're different. So is that a, are we discriminating by telling the woman, you are going to be giving birth? And the man is not going to be the one actually giving birth. They're just created differently. They have a different role. So people and souls are not identical. It's just a fact. Why? Because Yishpo Chalukat Tafkidim, as we say in Hebrew, Hashem gives out jobs, gives out missions, we're not going to make everybody a lawyer, thank God. <laughs> not everybody's going to be a doctor. Not everybody's going to be a plumber or a carpenter. Not everybody's going to be an engineer. Somehow the mazal, and it's fascinating, somehow the mazal of every individual will guide him to be what he needs to be. That's how it works out. People somehow are guided. And even though some say, I'm going to be what my father was, I'm going to be this because this is good, he thinks he makes a decision, but he's not. It's the mazal that guides everyone to his profession. So that profession is a type of mission, too, because he contributes to this world. By the way, to be a criminal is not a real profession. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> that's not on the list. Some people choose to be criminals, but that's not one of the missions. That's not one of the professions. So the baby comes into this world, Jew or non-Jew, each one with a unique mission. Now, that's individually, but as a nation, the Jewish people have their own mission. Okay, So every human being has his own mission, plus the Jewish people have a unique mission that is theirs. And what is the unique mission of the Jewish people? Lehavdil ben haor lachoshech, to distinguish between light and darkness to distinguish between the forces of good and evil. That's it. That's in short. How we do that is through the performance of the mitzvot. But if you want, in a few words, to define the mission of the Jew, 
he has to show the world, teach the world, that there's a difference between right and wrong, light and darkness, good and bad. That's his job. You be the one to teach that. Why? Why, why, why does this have to be taught? Because not everyone will know it on, this, on their own. Now, at least they will not at least have a accurate perception of the differences between right and wrong. I mean, humanity knows a little bit, a little bit, and I'll explain why soon. A little bit the differences between some right and some wrong, but not entirely. That's part of the Jew's job to teach the world that there's a God, a supreme being, that we're accountable for our actions. Life is purposeful, and as we live our life in serving God, in doing the right thing and staying out of trouble, we need to have clarity between what, that which is acceptable and that which is not acceptable. And if we do our job correctly, then we will be not only elevating the physical world, we will be making this world a uh, place where the Shekhinah, where the Divine Presence can reside. And that is, as the rabbis tell us, is called letaken olam b'malchut shakai, to fix the world, or to prepare the world, that this is where God will reign, even though he reigns all over the world. But it's not observable to everyone. So if we want to bring him down for everyone to recognize him, we have to do certain things to bring it to the attention of all the inhabitants of the world, that this is a fact, and if we were to do that, if that was always done, of course, there would never be any problems in the world. The world would have been a paradise. Everything would have worked out so good. No problems. But obviously, the evil inclination is much more powerful than, than what most of us think. It is a very, very um, dangerous uh, enemy. And his job is, of course, not to let us have it easy. And unfortunately, he's been winning many times. But still, the job of the Jew has always been to take the lead, to live by example, and to teach everyone else the difference between right and wrong. Why do we have right and wrong? Simple explanation is because we need to have free will. In order to have free will, the people will choose one over the other, and as a result of, of making the right choice, they will be rewarded in the afterlife in Olam Abba, you need to give them the two choices. If everything is obvious, then we're robots. It doesn't make sense. So life is about choices. It has to be about choices. For those of you who want to have a little bit more of an understanding of why these forces are so opposite, so different, there's a lecture called The Forces of Light and Darkness on YouTube that you can see, that you can hear that discusses this a little bit more in depth. Now, even though the good and the bad are very, very different, the Kabbalah teaches that the bad is not completely bad. It also has sparks of holiness. Very important point, and keep this in mind as we go through the first chapter in the Tanya, that the Ra, the Kohot Ra, the evil forces, also contain sparks of holiness. They have to. If they wouldn't have any sparks of holiness, the Kabbalah teaches they cannot survive. Just think of sparks of holiness as a partial connection to God. One way to understand it today is if you have internet, or if you have reception on your cell phone, sometimes you have partial reception, and sometimes you have, right? better reception. There's always a little bit of reception in the bad. Holy sparks, a little bit, a little bit of a connection there. Not too much. All right. So what is, how does the Jew fit into all of this? What is he exactly supposed to do when he filters out the good from the bad? He's being reminded, listen, even though there's all these forces that are contrary to you, to what you want to do, it is not your job to destroy it. The bad is also needed in the world. 
the bat has a job too. We said everybody has a job. The bat has a job too. Now what is your job when you filter? You're going to filter the good from the bad. You're going to elevate the bad. This is a very important way where Judaism is different than all the other religions. There are some religions in the East where they try to... Um, I guess a good word for it would be to abstain from all that is physical. They don't get married. They barely eat. You know what I mean? To be ascetic. <clears throat> Judaism says, no, 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 no. That's not the idea. Don't kill the physical. Elevate it. Sanctify it. You're going to eat? Make sure you make a blessing before you eat. After you finish eating, make a blessing. Say thank you. Recognize who gave you the food. Don't eat too much. So don't kill the physical. The physical is necessary. We live in a physical world. Don't kill your body. Get married. Have children. Have a relationship with your wife. A, 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 a normal, normal, healthy relationship that you're supposed to have. Have kids. Right? Don't kill the physical. Elevate it. Sanctify it. And that's what the mitzvot do. We have mitzvot to teach us how to sanctify that which is physical. So now that we understand more or less what the mission of the Jew is, let's go into the Tanya, the first chapter. The Tanya says like this, based on the Gemara that I just read for you, that I just quoted, that they tell the child, they tell the soul, before it comes out to this world, be it Sadiq and don't be a Rasha. He goes on to say as follows, and even if the entire world tells you that you are a good man, you are a Sadiq, don't believe them. Think of yourself as a Rasha. That's what the rabbis tell us. So he quotes that, and it's very interesting. What, what, what's going on here? You know, was here we're told be a Sadiq, which we understand. That is the ultimate goal. Don't be a rasha, meaning stay out of trouble, which is in itself a question, by the way. Why say both? Be a tzaddik means not to be a rasha. And then, even if the whole world tells you, you're a good man, you're such an angel, don't believe them. Always think of yourself as a rasha. So what's the question? The question is, wait a minute, rabbis tell us in Pirkei Avot, just the opposite. Never consider yourself as a wicked person. Don't look at yourself like a wicked person. Exactly the opposite of what it just said. And besides that, if you think of yourself as a rasha, you're going to be sad and depressed, and you're not going to be doing the avodat Hashem, the service of Hashem with simchayim, with joy. So that defeats the whole purpose. And if you're not going to think of yourself as a, as a rasha, then you're actually looking down and being disrespectful perhaps, or being overconfident, that perhaps you, after all, you, we all make mistakes. So in, in some ways, you do want to take the blame. If you want an answer to this question a little bit more in depth, you have to wait till chapter 13. <laughs> but he does begin to explain what this is all about now. So what we're going to do right now even though it's a short chapter, we're going to see that it's not as simple as we think. There, was, there is a need sometimes for a person to remind himself that he's not perfect. In other words, even though everybody tells you you're such a good man, don't believe them because we have to remind ourselves we're not perfect. Who, who, told, us to, who told us to us? There's no such a thing as a righteous man that only, only does good and never commits a wrong. So we need to remind ourselves it's okay. So what the Gemara is saying, what the rabbis tell us is in some ways understandable. Don't be overconfident. You may come to arrogance. Who says you're such a sadiq? So even if everybody tells you, you know what, you're great. Don't think like that. Plus, besides this, 
we all always have something to fix. There's always something to correct. It's not like we finished our job and our mission is complete. That's it. Nothing to correct. So therefore, even if everybody tells you you're a tzaddik, think of yourself as a rasha because you always want to continuously grow and look out for any fault you may have, any weakness that needs to be worked on. On the other hand, the rabbis, of course, what they said is also true. Don't consider yourself a rasha because otherwise you're going to give up. Oh, I'm a rasha anyway. I already did this. It's too late for me. I'm too old. I've already done all the terrible things. I can't fix them. You see where there's room for the two ideas. Don't consider yourself a rasha. No. That is the evil inclination telling you, you're a bad boy anyway. Then why do this? You're going to do this mitzvah, but you don't do this one. Then why do this one? I told you the story about this individual I know that is a mover, goes across the country, and he's not always careful with eating kosher food. I asked him once, why don't you put on tzitzit? Tzitzit is so easy. It costs only a few dollars. Nobody even will see it. It's underneath your shirt. And it's such a great protection. Very, very important mitzvah. He says, how could I put on tzitzit if I'm not always careful with kosher? See? So you know who told you that? You're yet serara, you're even clinician. Do whatever you can. That's the right attitude. Just because a person is not Shomer Shabbat yet, doesn't mean he should not put on tefillin. How could I keep Shabbat and put on tefillin? Or how could a woman go to the mikveh if uh, she doesn't light candles? What does one thing have to do with the other? You do whatever you can. You start somewhere. Who's telling you not to do anything? The Yetzara. Oh, you are a Rasha anyway. You're secular. You have a title. Secular, not religious. No, Chas Shalom. You do whatever you know, whatever you can. And little by little, you build up on that. So, so there's definitely a need to remind the Jew, don't consider yourself a Rasha. So the author of the Tanya goes on to explain like this. In reality, Part of the reason why the rabbis tell us different, not contradictory, but different ideas over here is because they're really talking to different individuals. It all depends on the individual. This book is mostly for the average individual. His name is Benoni. Benoni, Mutawasit, right? I guess. Or in Arabic, Mutawasit. Yeah, average, Benoni, right? But there are individuals who are more tzaddikim and those who are more reshaim. So therefore he begins to explain that there's all kinds of neshamot that have evolved. Not to start with, because to start with the neshama is pure. Even though, by the way, in the Kabbalah there is a, there is a discussion about various levels of neshamot, but that we don't have an understanding of how that works. There are levels of neshamot, even before they come down to this world. And those neshamot, the higher neshamot, are the great sages and the leaders and the judges and so forth. So there is something like that. But we're more concerned about this world where there's free will, where the individual is to blame what he becomes, as far as righteous or not. So he says like this. There is a, there's an individual who's called Sadiq Verano. He's righteous, but he has a hard time. There is a tzaddik, Vetovlo, a righteous man who has it going well for him. There's a rasha, Vetovlo, a wicked man who has it good for him. A rasha, Veralo, a wicked man who has it hard. And there's a benoni, like I told you, an average. So this book, especially this section, is really intended or designed for the Benoni. person who is very, very righteous, even though the advice is welcome, doesn't have that many difficulties to overcome. The advice being suggested here, all the advice that he gives to help individuals become stronger in their connection with Hashem is intended for the average individual. Now, what does average mean? We're going to explain that in a moment. So you have individuals who are very distant, very weak. He calls them Rashaim, right? We know that. 
But when we think of a rasha, we think of a wicked man. It's not necessarily a wicked man. When you see the, the, the term rasha, all it means many times is that this individual does more wrong than he does right. It doesn't mean he's a very bad person. Okay? So you have various levels of individuals who perform in different ways. But when we say perform, what does that mean? So the simple meaning of tzaddik veralo is as follows. Tzaddik is righteous, but for some reason he's having a hard time in life. He's struggling. Now, I have a whole lecture about this. How could it be that good people suffer? He's, so, he's a big tzaddik. So when we say tzaddik veralo, it could be that he has a few sins. After all, he's, he's in pain, he's in suffering, nobody suffers for nothing. And it could be that this is from a previous lifetime. Mm -hmm. So this is the very simple, literal meaning of tzaddik veralo, that he's having a hard time even though he's a tzaddik. According to the Zohar, there's a whole different meaning over here. It's a beautiful explanation that describes to us what is going on in many people's life. Tzaddik veralo means that this soul is a good soul, righteous individual, but he has a hard time with weaknesses that he has to overcome. What that means is he's tempted from time to time and he has to work hard to defeat that evil inclination. Whereas you have other individuals, eh, I'm not even tempted, I'm not even attracted, I don't even think about it. You have guys, you have people, who are good. They will make the right decision, but it cost them. It, it took an effort to control. Imagine somebody who's angry, but he holds himself back. Oh, but he's burning mad inside. He's holding himself back. So he's, he's a tzaddik berado. What's a real tzaddik using this example? Eh, I don't care. You know, it doesn't bother me. Somebody insults him, he looks the other way. Nothing happened. Didn't bother me. Didn't affect me. A tzaddik veralo means he's a tzaddik. He will make the right choices. But only after he'd, he had to battle with the Yetzirah. It would be better if he wouldn't have to battle so much. He would just say, I'm not interested. How could I do this? He doesn't have to think twice. So therefore, the ralo here, what, what does the ralo mean means? It means that this little bit of evil, or the weaknesses in him, kafuf lo, as we say in Hebrew, kafuf lo means he subdues them. He's able to subdue his yetzer, but he has to fight. What would be the ideal is that he doesn't have to fight. And you know what? After a while, people who are really, really good don't have to fight. They understand that this is wrong. Take, let's take another example. Money. Money, you know, is the biggest yetzerara, the biggest evil inclination. There are people who, if you offer them $500 as a bribe, let's say a bribe, yeah, $500 is not enough, so they won't take it. After all, they're not corrupt. If they're corrupt, they'll take $10 too. <laughs> you know, they'll take anything. But they're not corrupt, so $500. If you give them $2,000, they'll think twice about it. They'll say, well, I can't. Yeah. My, favorite, my, my favorite example is on Shabbat. Somebody sees $100 on the street. Fresh banknote, you know. <laughs> <laughs> what is he going to do? Is he going to pick it up? And some people tell him to just kick it in the bushes. <laughs> pick it up <laughs> after Shabbat. They can't resist. You know, this is very normal. Very normal. You ask the average person this question, what will he do? Now, he might be a tzaddik, right? So it's a hundred man. Okay, so a hundred dollars, you'll just forget it? What if it was a thousand dollars? What if it was a bundle of ten thousand dollars? You see how? Raise the, the bar, they say in English. So a tzaddik, a real tzaddik, knows this is a challenge this is he's being tested from above he doesn't think too much about it he might look at the money and maybe even count it <laughs> 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 but 
He won't bother with it. It's a dick Veralo. He, he has to fight. He says, yeah, but it's Shabbat. It's Muktzah. I can't touch it. I can't take it, you know. Or it's not the Shabbat that's bothering you. It belongs to someone. You know, the, depending on what the issue here is, because if it's money but it has no name and it's just, you know, it's just all over the floor, you know, how are you going to know who it belongs to? So there's always temptations to give it back to its rightful owner, not to touch it, it's Shabbat. We always have this kind of situation. Husband and wife have a fight or are about to have a fight. Better go pick up my mother, she's coming, right, at the airport. And he doesn't want to go because he has a class or whatever. He has a challenge. How does he deal with it professionally? How does he refuse it to his wife, but, but doesn't make it look like he's refusing it? So I tell people, just send a limousine with the, with the flowers and tell your mother-in-law, you know, welcome home, you can stay as long as you want, <laughs> you know, and uh, we love you and so forth, but I couldn't come personally because I have a class. You know, you, you have to be tactful, you have to find the right compromise, you have to try to make pe people feel good. Uh, so we, we have all these types of tests. So. One who's a tzaddik Veralo, he has to control himself. He has to somehow um, not come across as one who's, who's bad, uh, who easily is tempted and falls. But at least he succeeds. So that, is, that is, will help us understand a little bit what Benoni is. Because a Benoni is such an individual who's not necessarily always on the right side always doing the right thing. He's in between. He's, he's, he needs to be able to, conti he's continuously trying to fight the evil inclination. And he's never safe. Rabbis tell us, don't ever think you're safe just because you're over 80, you know, whatever. Things can happen even at a later age, even though you were very good in the past, people are tempted. So a Benoni is what we'll be talking a lot about, an individual who has these struggles, you know, what is the best way for him to stay in line? So we said before that the simple understanding of even though everybody tells you that you are righteous, you always think of yourself as a rasha, don't believe what they say is because there's always something to fix. Don't ever think that you're perfect. On the other hand, don't consider yourself a rasha because you don't want to give up hope. You don't want to think of yourself as a lost case, as someone that can never change. So the Balatanya goes on to say, the reason why the struggles occur is as follows. And here he makes a revelation, a big revelation, that is mentioned in the, in the Kabbalah. Part of the reason why we have struggles is because we have two kinds of neshamot. A nefesh eloki and a nefesh behemi. A divine soul. Now everything is divine when we talk. When we talk about the nefesh, of course it's divine. But the nefesh eloki is more spiritual. Let's just say. And then there's a nefesh behemi that is less spiritual. That animal spirit called nefesh behemi is the one that's closest to the physical body. It is the one that's responsible for the heart, for the circulation of the blood. It is closer or more involved with the physical body, and because of that, it has ta'avot. It has all kinds of desires. And these desires come about as a result of the four elements of which man consists of. Earth, water, fire, and air. The earth, the earthy element gives him the weakness towards being slow lazy or being strict and I talk a little bit more about this in astrology the air element gives one the inclination towards arrogance or talking negatively about people it's all this it's in the speech fire is about chutzpah and anger insolence in anger, and water is the various kinds of desires that come about 
through the element of water. That people enjoy certain pleasures in life. That's from the element of water. So all of these yesodot, all of these elements, are to be found in every human being. Some have more of one than another, and that depends on their mazala. But basically, we all are made up of these four elements. So the nefesh behemi, the spirit, the physical or the animal spirit, is the one that experiences these feelings. But these feelings are not always positive feelings. These are negative feelings. And because they're negative, obviously, this, they, they pose a challenge. They present a challenge to the individual who wants to do the right thing. In this book, therefore, what you will find is advice on how to help the nefesh loki, the divine spirit, overcome the nefesh abehemi. Or I should say the, the other way around. How to help the nefesh abehemi, how to help the, the animal spirit elevate itself in order that it should not be so low and so focused on doing that which is physical. So a great deal of what he teaches is how, to, how one can help himself, how one can control himself. Because of this continuous battle between these two types of souls. But now he makes another revelation which is very not understood by a lot of people. And that's why I'd like to clarify it a little bit more. He says that there's a difference in the soul between a Jew and a non-Jew. So remember, I gave you an introduction a little bit before as to there's no discrimination. It is just about giving out jobs, everyone having a different mission, right? And it's not that one is better than another. It's just a fact that people are different. So there are certain souls that are simply have a different mission. And he says like this, this Jewish soul that has two nefashot, one more spiritual, more divine, the other one, the animal spirit. The animal spirit is called, or the animal spirit comes from klipat noga. For those of you who never studied Kabbalah, you will never, you will never encounter this concept. It's not used in any other context, klipat noga. Klipa means the shell. Noga, well, Noga is translated as Venus, but this has nothing to do with Venus. It's just called Klipat Noga. For whatever reason, it is a uh, type of Neshama that consists of both good and bad. Okay? This is important to remember. In other words, it consists of the two abilities, purity and impurity, I think purity and impurity is better than good and bad. And because it consists of the two, it has the ability to do the right thing, but it can also do the wrong thing. Klipat Noga is about ta'avot. It's, it's about certain desires, certain inclinations that the neshama has towards the physical world, that which is more physical, as opposed to the other neshama that is purely interested in that which is spiritual and divine. So, one more time, it's important to remember, the nefesh loki that we all have only wants to do the right thing in what, that which is divine, whereas the nefesh behemi, especially that it's coming from klipat noga, it also may want to do good things, but it has an interest in the pleasures of the physical world. What good things can this nefesh behemi do? It's, a, it's, a, it's an animal spirit to be kind and compassionate and helpful. Yes, it, it wants to do good things too. So sometimes even though one may have a nefesh abemi from klipat noga, which means that he's interested in the physical world, he may at times do good things too. Okay, so far so good. So, two kinds of neshamot. One is more physical, one is more spiritual, and this physical one all right, can sometimes do good things. Well, fine. Now comes a little bit of a revelation. The non-Jewish world does not have, for the most part, a neshama 
from Klipat Noga. They have it completely from the Sitra Ahara. The Sitra Ahara means the impure forces. Okay. In other words, there's all kinds of souls. We said that before. All kinds. There's some that come from the from this camp, others that come from this camp. But this other camp called the Sitra Ahara does not really contain a Neshama from Klipat Noga. And therefore, what that means is that it's only interested in itself and not in that which is divine. Wow, as soon as you hear that, as soon as you read that, you said, what? What about all those good people who are not Jewish? That do good things that are so kind, right? So this is very much misunderstood, even though different rabbis have tried to explain this. I think that there's, there's a lack of clarity so I'm going to elaborate just a little bit more because this is a very important point. Remember, there's no here superiority complex, no discrimination here. It's just a lack of understanding of what the Kabbalah teaches. Different kinds of souls. When we're talking about a soul that is not from Klipat Noga, a soul that is from the other side, it still has, remember, it still has holy sparks. It's still divine. And because of the holy sparks, it wants to do good things too. Okay? However, what's the big difference? The big difference is that it requires a lot more work to bring out the good in it than one who's from Klipat Noka. That's all. Well, that's one difference. It requires a lot more work because those holy sparks are trapped. What is a Klipat? Klipat is a cover. It's concealing. But it's more than that. It's a lot more than that, and I'm going to get to that. For now, just remember it has holy sparks, it is capable of doing good, but it requires a lot more work than one that is from Klipat Noga. Klipat Noga also has a challenge, also has to do battle, but it somehow it is able to, with a little bit of effort, succeed. That which is from the other side has a lot more difficulty. And even if it does good, even if it does good, it cannot transform itself to be that which it, it's not. One that is from Klipat Noga can transform himself, can elevate himself, can take that which was bad or impure and elevate it and become a whole different person. That which is not from Klipat Noga cannot transform himself. However, he can still do something. And this is what they don't explain, but it's important for me to bring out those individuals who are from the other side can observe the seven Noahkite laws. And the Rambam teaches that any non-Jew who performs the seven Noahkite laws and does so because Hashem tzivakacha, because Hashem commanded, in other words, that he relates his responsibilities to the fact that Hashem is telling him and he's not doing it on his own from his good heart, then he has a chilek lo He will have a share to the world to come. What made him so special all of a sudden because he did it because Hashem said so? That he has a share to the world to come? You know, what's interesting about this is that other religions teach you that if you don't be like them, you, you go to hell. You go to Gehenom. You burn there. You <laughs> we don't do that. You don't have to be like us to have a share to the world to come. A chassid umot haolam, as it is called, the righteous from the Gentiles. If they just do the seven Noahide laws and they did so because Hashem Tziva, they related to Hashem, they have a share to the world to come. In other words, what they're doing by observing these mitzvot <coughs> is connecting to the Kedusha. So they can connect. If you connect, I mean, you may not be a full-fledged member because you did not convert, but you're connecting. You're, be, you're, you're basically saying, I identify with this mission. I'd love to be like you, even though I'm a little bit different. Okay, so what? You have your mission, and I have my mission. The Jew has a big mission. Why is he given Klipat Noga? Because that's his job, is to filter out right from wrong, pure from impure. He can't eat certain foods because they're un unclean and impure. So since he has that job of filtering, of separating, he has to be given that, that which is mixed of the two. Where do you see a mixture of the two? 
in Etz Hadat, Tovara, in the beginning of Bereshit, where you have a tree of knowledge of good and bad. Mixed. There's a mixture in this world. It's concealed. Comes along the Jew, and that's his mission. You separate it. Well, if I'm going to separate, I have to have that ability to do so. The other one doesn't have to do that. The non-Jew doesn't have to. That's not his job. That he doesn't have to have a neshama from Klipat Noga. But he does have Nitzotzot. He has sparks of holiness. He can be kind. But it's not so simple. Even though he can be kind, there's a big difference between those who have it in them, in the neshama, embedded as a purpose, as a goal in life, to be kind and generous and benevolent and so forth, versus those that have to labor hard to do so. The reason is like this. It is, it is mentioned in the Kabbalah that the difference between the two souls is not just that one has good and bad and the other one just sparks of goodness. It's that those that don't have the Klipat Noga and their soul is from the other camp, most of the time they are motivated to do things for their own self-interest. Remember the French president, De Gaulle? He used to say nations don't have friends, they have interests. That's exactly the description of this particular neshama. It's not about friends. It's not about being good because that's what we need to aspire to do. It's because it's it's good thing because it serves my interest. If it is, serves their interest, they will be good. Now, this does not mean that everyone who's from the other camp will only do things that serve their interest because this klipat noga soul is scattered all over the world. The Jews have a concentration of it because that is their mission, to separate. But there, are, there is Klippat Noga all over, and that is where you have the righteous of the Gentiles. Who are the righteous of the Gentiles, the real righteous ones that are selfless? Those that have Klippat Noga. Those that don't have the Neshama of Klippat Noga are not selfless. And that is why I'd like to describe to you what does it mean to be selfless. Where do you see the difference between one who selfless and not? And in English it's called altruism. The definition of altruism is the belief in or practice of disinterested and selfless concern for the well-being of others. It's not that one receives some intrinsic reward, like a personal gratification. Oh, I just helped him. And he feels good about that. No, 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 no. It's the belief that this is what you need to do without any interest whatsoever, that is not something that everybody is capable of doing. You want to know the best proof of this? Look at all the wars in the history of mankind. What is war if not selfishness, usually? Yeah. So, it is, it is a very important distinction between this kind of a soul that has it as its aspiration, as a belief that this is what I got to do. Why is that part of the Jewish belief? Because the entire creation, the rabbis tell us, Kabbalah teaches, is an act of love. Judaism therefore teaches that love means to give. Because the human being has to eventually teach himself to become a giver, not just a taker. We're all receiving. We're always receiving. No. Learn to be also a giver. So we have all the mitzvot that guide us and teach us how to become givers and not just takers. And why are we doing it? Because we want to emulate the Creator. Because the creation is all about giving. It's an act of love. So love in Judaism is a very powerful concept. It's not only powerful because we know love is powerful. It's not only powerful because it's, 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 a, it's something very, very uh, important in our life, in how we express it and how we all want it. Besides that, this is the goal. The goal is to give. The goal is to emulate the ways of God in a powerful way. What's a powerful way? To give to someone else. And that does not come easy to a lot of people. Unless they have it as part of their belief. Since it is part of our mission, then we have to have the ability to do so uh, instinctively. Not that it comes so hard. For those who don't have that as their mission, they don't need that kind of a neshama. They still have sparks of holiness. 
or another way of looking at it, I, 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 I can, you can also explain it as follows. As, as a nation, the Gentiles don't have Kalipat Noga, but as individuals they can have. That's another way of explaining it. It's not that they don't have it at all, but we as a nation have it, because that's our job. They as nations don't have it. That's what they're only interested in, their interest. But as individuals, some of them do. And there are some very excellent, beautiful souls out there that are not Jewish, who are so selfless, so dedicated, self-sacrifice and everything because of Klippat Noga. But if there's no Klippat Noga, then there's usually no interest, no desire whatsoever in doing the will of Hashem. Just leave me alone, don't bother me. It's not true, I don't believe it. How could somebody be so unsensitive and not want it, not aspire to it? Because there's no, there's, there's no Klippat Noga in him. There may be some sparks of goodness, of holiness, but that's it. Just to finish up, <clears throat> after the Hurban, Bet Amidash, after the destruction of the Second Temple, we see all of a sudden Islam and Christianity coming to the forefront, wanting to be monotheistic. They were pagan before. All of this is an indicator that the light of Hashem is little by little being uncovered and permeating everything in this physical world. However, it doesn't mean that they're going to change because look at all the wars ever since they became monotheistic. In other words, they in themselves, their nature has not changed too much. But it's definitely one step forward you know, not to be pagan and to accept that there's a creator to the world. But they still have a way to go. Every good deed, every good deed that a Jew or non-Jew does in this world makes a difference, regardless of one's neshama. Because even though some neshamot may be more inclined and some souls less inclined. Still, a good deed counts a lot. Remember, the, the light of Hashem is concealed. So every good deed does not only change the person a little bit, it also brings more light into the world. What happens if it's the other way around? Bad deeds, then it brings darkness into the world and the world suffers. You know what happened during the Mabul time, during the flood? Because the people corrupted their ways, the animals corrupted their way. Look at this. The animals don't have free will. How could an animal corrupt its way and crossbreed? A dog goes with a cat? What for? It doesn't make sense. It's not natural. If the human beings act in an unnatural way, so does the animals. They contaminate the whole world. They drive away the light. And what you have is all bad. Everything corrupts. You have earthquakes and hurricanes. Nature breaks its laws because the human being is breaking the laws of Hashem. So we can see a reflection in the world of how humanity is behaving or not behaving, depending on how much good there is or how much, unfortunately, bad there is. But all of this will end very, very soon when Mashiach comes. What will Mashiach accomplish? Mashiach will do something that could not have been done till now, and that is to break the klipa of bad. Klipa of bad, remember the bad shell? It cannot, those sparks, the holy sparks, are stuck inside. They cannot come out. They're there. In order to bring it out, you have to break it. There's no other choice. Until now, you couldn't break it. Hashem wanted the world to have these two camps, to have all the challenges, to allow the evil inclination to do what it does. But when Mashiach comes and the light of Hashem is revealed, then all the impurities will disappear, and everybody will know Hashem. Amen. Amen. Yes.